sea. We're singing for the glory of the risen King. Jesus, shine your light and let the whole world see. We're singing for the glory of the risen King. Savior, he can move the mountains. My God is mighty to save. He is mighty to save forever. Author of salvation, he rose and conquered the grave. Jesus conquered the grave. Be seated. Well, I'm so very excited about Fuel the Vision, and I hope you are too. And I just got a text from the nursery. It said we have 44 babies in there. I think of those that have come before us, and I think of the next generation. Forty-four babies. Family, it's time (laughs) that we rise up to the call of God and move forward in faith. And I'm so excited about what God is doing here and so humbled and honored to be a part of it. Uh, We have been in a series called The New Rules of Resolution that we don't want to just change something this year, but we want to change the way that we change. And so we have been using Colossians chapter 2, verse 6 and 7, and as our foundational text, and I want to invite you, if you have your Bibles, open them up to the book of Colossians. Let's go back to chapter 2 and look at verses 6 and 7 once more. If you can say it from memory, say it from memory. If you need to look in your Bible, look in your Bible. If you need to look on the screen, look on the screen. But uh, today we wrap up this series in uh, Colossians 2, 6, and 7. You've been good to us. Uh, but it's time for us to move on because there's other passages of Scripture that need our attention. But one more time, Colossians 2, 6, and 7. Let's say it together. So then, just as you receive Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to live your lives in Him, rooted and built up in Him, strengthened in the faith as you were taught, and overflowing with thankfulness. And the church said, Amen. What a, what a, what a pack of verses here. What a package that God has given us in these words. And we started out a few weeks ago, and I just want to run through very quickly. If you're a guest of ours today, or if you missed a week, I told you if you were, if you were committed to being here for four or five weeks, I believed that God would speak a message into your heart. And we started from day one saying, you know what? It's not a project. It's a process that the faith journey that we're involved in, it's not a project. You know, we are project-oriented people. I look around this auditorium and I see a lot of project-oriented people, praise God. But, but the spiritual journey is not a project, it's a process. Continue, Paul says, to live your lives in Him. Continue this, this process that God is unfolding in our lives. And what does that do for us? What's the application? I mean, I want to get real, real today and this be a, a, an applicable message for you. But what's the application to that? Well, if, if we start looking at things in, in our spiritual journey as a process rather than a project, then what does that do in our own lives? It starts changing the way that we think. We start changing the way that we change, that, that we look at this as a big picture, that students, it's, it's a process, that God has you on this journey as a process, and that we stop asking these type questions of, you know, why is this happening to me, God? Why is this happening to me of all people? And because we understand it's a process, we start asking, okay, God, what are you teaching me in the process? And that's a fundamentally different question. What are you teaching me in this moment? This trial that I'm going through, some of you have battled illnesses. This trial that I'm going some of you have, have suffered job loss. Some of you have, have suffered the death of a loved one. Some of you have, have suffered uh, insecurity and financial stress in your own life. And, 
What, what in this process, God, what are you teaching me? And when we start to, to change our mindset and start viewing the Christian life as a process and not a project, it changes the way we think. Then we, we next said it's not achieving, it's receiving. Just as you received Christ Jesus as Lord, then continue to live your lives in Him. Remember, just as you received, it's not about achieving, it's about receiving. We receive Christ into our lives, we receive Christ as Lord, and then we achieve through the Lord. And then get this, this is the biggest, this is the most important point right here, is that we we don't just stop there, but then He receives any good, any glory that comes from my life. So it's the cycle of the Christian life. We receive from the Lord, we achieve through the Lord, and then he receives anything good, any glory that comes from my life, he gets it. He gets it. Not me, not you. He gets it because he's worthy of it. Receive, achieve, receive. When we see this process, the cycle of the Christian life, and then we said it's not about a competition, it's a calling. That we, we, we tend to get to in these places in life where we, where we see somebody else and that the death of contentment is what? The death of contentment is comparison. And we start comparing ourselves to other people. Students, you do this all the time. Men, we do this all the time. You got a bigger truck than I do. You know, they got a bigger screen TV than I, they got, and then we just, the list just goes on and on and on, and we start comparing ourselves to other people, and the death of contentment in our own lives is when we start comparing ourselves to other people and don't recognize that we have everything that we need in Jesus Christ. Amen. And so it's not a competition, it's a calling, because we, we come to this, this spirit of condemnation when we look at somebody else and say, I can never be like that person, I can never do what that person does, I can never, you know, uh, achieve what they achieve, and we, we have this spirit of condemnation that comes over us because we're looking over here. But then we get over here and we think, well, I'm pretty good. I mean, you're, you're sitting in church on Sunday, you good people, you're all good people. And we, we start saying, well, I'm, you know, I, I may not be the best, but I'm pretty good. I'm better than that guy over there. I'm, I'm, I'm at least doing better than him. And so we get to this spirit of complacency in life, that we become spiritually complacent. And the spirit of condemnation and the spirit of complacency are both totally unhealthy places to be when it comes to being a, a Christ follower. And so we remind ourselves that it's, it's not a competition, it's a calling. And then... A couple weeks ago, we talked about it's not what you would, it's what you can. I would if I could, but I can't, so I won't. This phrase defines a lot of us in life. I would if I could, but I can't. And what we're reminded of, so then just as you received Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to live your lives in him, rooted and built up in him, Strengthen the faith as you were taught, overflowing with thankfulness, that, that it's not, not just about what you would, it's about what you can. And so today the big idea is this, let's jump into it. It's not trying, it's training. This is the last one, these five facts. And you'll see our icon for the day up here on the stage. Somebody told me it looked like a minion from Despicable Me. I promise you it's not. It's a boxing glove. Okay, and that's the icon for today as we talk about training. It's not trying, it's training. That daily we have the opportunity to die to self. And that the same grace that saved us is now going to change us. And one of the things that I see over and over again in ministry is that people get excited about living for God. They kind of get this rush and they get excited about living for God. And then they start trying and they try and they try and they try and they try and they they fail to realize that they are committing to trying, but they're not committed to training. And... I've struggled with this in my own life. I've confessed to you before. I've struggled with my prayer life. I've struggled with my getting in the Word, opportunities and devotional life. And what we want to talk about today is that it's not about trying, it's about training. Because we fell at these commitments and we start to ask this question, you know, how can, how can we ever have real lasting change? You know, we, we, we feed ourselves on this healthy diet of guilt because we fail at at these commitments that we want to embark upon in our spiritual journey and how can we how can we have real lasting change and I want you to get this it's actually 
written in one of the questions to the, to the connect groups at the bottom of your uh, sermon notes there, but I want you to get this phrase here. The Christian life isn't going from event to event or project to project in our own effort. Instead, it's a day-by-day effort of submitting to God in his process of training us. And so three things, you'll see them in your sermon notes there, three things, three ways that God trains us. Kingdom training 101. Now this is not, get this, this is not three ways to get God to love you more. It's not what this is. This is is three things for us to consider, three ways that God uses to train us because he already loves us. Because we're already approved in him. And so I want to start with Hebrews chapter 12. It's, it's not, not on the screen or not in your worship guide, but I, I want to read this to you. It's the NIRV version. It says this, our parents trained us for a little while. Hebrews 12, 10. They did what they thought was best, but God trains us for our good. He wants us to share in his holiness. Now get this, verse 11. No training seems pleasant at the time. In fact, it seems painful, but later on it produces a harvest of godliness and peace, and it does that for those who have been trained by it. It does that for those who have been trained by it. So number one, I want you to write these down in your notes. Number one, I want you to write down, change your paradigms. Change your paradigms. Now, the word paradigm is just a a big word that means a typical example or a pattern of something. It's kind of like a model. And I want you to read what Paul says in Romans 12, 2. He says these these words, Romans 12, 2, do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and prove what God's will is, his good, his pleasing, and his perfect will change the way that we change i remember there's a shoe store uh in my neighborhood growing up that i would go to often not because i was buying shoes but because they had an indoor basketball court and so i'd go to this shoe store to play basketball and i remember one friday night a lot of friends had gone off and they were going to the movies and doing different things and i wanted to go and and practice and play basketball and so i went to this shoe store and went in and i started I started shooting, and I was shooting around, and all all of a sudden, this guy came in and started shooting around with me, and we got to talking. His name was Tyrone, and so Tyrone is is passing me the ball, and I'm shooting, and and he gives me the ball, and I kind of shuffle my feet, and I shoot, and I shuffle my feet, and I shoot, and I shuffle my feet, and I shoot, and and, and I'm making quite a few of them, and so I'm thinking, you know, I'm impressing Tyrone here. He thinks, you know, I'm I'm, more of the baller than I really am, And, and all of a sudden, Tyrone says, you need to... You need, to, you need to change the way that you're, you're moving your feet. I'm like, who is he to tell me? I mean, I just hit, I just hit a good three out of ten. <laughs> who is he to tell me that I need to start changing my feet when I shoot the ball? He said, that's not, he said, the way you're shuffling your feet, that's not a real game situation. He said, you need to take a step and then pull up and shoot. He said, he said, try it. So, so he passed me the ball, and I, I, I took a step, and I went up to shoot, and it was an air ball. I mean, it didn't hit, it didn't hit the rim. It didn't hit the net. It didn't hit anything. And, and finally, he, he, got, he got to working with me, and I, 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 went and I, I went and I stepped, and I shot one, and I went and I stepped, and I shot another one. And finally, I started getting the rhythm. And as he was training me, I began to to get down the, the pattern, the, this new paradigm of, of a way to shoot, if you will. And I went to basketball practice the, the following Monday, and I started doing that in basketball practice, and the coach was like, wow, you know, you, you've kind of, you, you've learned a little something new. You've changed your paradigm a little bit. And it was because somebody had the, somebody had the courage to tell me I needed to change, I needed to change the way that I stepped and my, and my shot. Lenny and I have done this this year. We decided that we're going to have a word of the year. And so we we came up with our word of the year. And I want to encourage you to do this in your own family, in your own house. I want you to to think about a word of the year. If if you were to to define your 2014 as one word, what would that word be? Don't say it out loud right now. Just think about it. What, What would be your one word 
for 2014. Lanny came up with, with the word sway. Sway. And, and she got that from Galatians 5.25 where Paul tells us to, to live in step with the Spirit. And some, some authors, some uh, scholars will, will use the, the phrase to walk in the sway of the Spirit. And so Lanny's word was sway. It was, you know, I want to walk in the sway of the Spirit. It's kind of like a sailboat that you have and, and the sail's up and you, and you rely on the wind to propel the boat forward. And so I'm going to ask her periodically, well, you know, what is, how, how is the word sway being incorporated into your life? Are you walking in the sway of the Spirit? My word is the word equip. The word equip. And I got this from a couple verses. One, in Hebrews 13, 20, the writer ends his, his letter by saying this, Now may the God of peace equip you with everything good for doing his will. That I want to be equipped by God so that in Ephesians 4, 12, where Paul says this, So Christ himself gave the apostles, prophets, evangelists, the pastors, and teachers to what? equip his people for works of service so the body of Christ may be built up. So I want to be equipped by God so that I can equip others. One of the greatest passions in my life is seeing your talents, your passions, and your interests being realized and used for the kingdom of God. And when I was looking at the, the team leaders up here for our Fuel the Vision campaign, I saw so many talented folks, and as I look across this auditorium, I see so many talented folks that, that have passions and interests, not, not just about giving money, but also about using your time and your talent and the ways that you use those to, to glorify God in your own life. How are you using your time and your talent and your treasure? And so our words are sway and equip. I don't know what your words will be, but... Uh, but Change your paradigms. Number two is this, develop your practices. Develop your practices. If you've ever been in a practice, you, you know uh, for a sports team or for band or for any type of, of practice situation, you have practices in your work. Some of you practice medicine. Some of you practice law. Some of you practice this. You practice that. You have practices that we, that we develop these rhythms in our life for. What are your practices, spiritually speaking? Have you developed your practices? How do you practice? Look what 1 Timothy 4, 8 says. In verse 7, he says, train yourself to be godly. And then verse 8, for physical training is of some value, but godliness has value for all things, holding promise for both the present life and the life to come. Yes, for those of you who run and exercise and all that, yes, yes, physical training has some value, but have you ever thought about your spiritual training in life. How much time and devotion are you devoting to that? I know there was a point in my life where my, my physical training uh, far exceeded my spiritual training. And, and I believe that there is there's this holistic call to, yes, there is some value to physical training, but what about your spiritual training? I want to show you this picture on the screen. This is an article. I want you to guess which one of your shepherds that is right there. For no money, because we don't do that, uh, but, but I'm not going to give you anything if you guess it right. But one of your shepherds is on the screen right now. That is Mr. Butch Ware, the man who was up here charging <laughs> our, our team leaders just a moment ago, Brother Butch. Uh, Butch played football up at Bridgeport High School in northeast Alabama. His football coach was a Golden Glove boxing champ. And so he had all the football players, for conditioning purposes, uh, they, they had to, to go through and, and, and train for boxing. And I was talking to Butch about, about just the training process that they had to go through and how, uh, how stringent it was. Uh, he said that they would wear 16-ounce gloves while they were training, and then in the actual matches, they would use 10-ounce gloves. Now, I want you to think about the spiritual applications in your own life how many of you have gone through seasons of life where you felt like you're wearing 16 ounce gloves I mean you just you've gone through those seasons and Butch talked about just how 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 uh, stringent this this process was and this training was I look at this next picture this is a picture of uh, Butch's wrestling team and he's there in the back in the middle 
I'm just going to tell y'all, Butch was a bad mamma jamma, all right? I'm just, I'm just going to tell I mean, I'm glad he is one of my shepherds, okay? Uh, there is no doubt about that. Um, but uh, it was so interesting listening to, to Butch talk about his training process, that he trained for months and months for a match that may last, get this, that may last 10 minutes. Trained months and months for that. Folks, let me tell you, in your spiritual walk, in your walk with Jesus Christ, you may go through some things for months and years and years and years so that you can get to a point when God calls you at that moment to be ready to speak for Him, to give Him the glory in that situation. You are prepared because you trained for it. Amen. God's calling saying, hey, amen. Amen. <laughs> There was a phone ringing, that's why I said that. But God uses these training opportunities to develop our practices so that he can receive the glory for it. And if you're going to grow in your faith, you must go through training. Do you have a practice of being thankful? Remember that last part of Colossians 2, 6, and 7? Strengthen in the faith as you were taught, as you were trained, and overflowing with y'all let me down let's see if this is overflowing with they almost got it this last time this is the biggest section i think in the whole auditorium overflowing with thankfulness do you practice thankfulness in your life 12 days ago we were inconvenienced a little bit weren't we Snow 